me arreglé para verte. Yo también me puse My Crew Next Level. Yo me puse un poco de lipstick. Puede que tengamos un poco de interrupciones. Unas aquí. invitadas. Perfecto. No. Ve abajo y ve la tele. Hoy, ahorita sí te doy permiso. Sí, la tele o si no, imposible. No, no importa. You want to do it in English so everybody can understand? Sí. Sí. And also I feel like you speak English um, more fluent. Sí. Um, perfect. So thank you so much for agreeing to this. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for Some, doing it. Someone to get dressed up for. I know. Thank you. Uh, I have a lot of people that always ask me about like you and my relationship with you and how do you work and stuff like that. And I guess we could use this time to kind of like let them know something that you want and kind of like inspire them and just make them understand. Hey, this is Constanza, right? Ines. Ines. Oh, this is Ines? Oh my God, Ines, you have changed so much. Ines Perfect. is getting bigger. I know. Okay, Ines is your twin and Constanza is Francisco's twin. Sí. Um, perfect. So, Carla, give me one sec. I'm just going to put my questions. Uh, could you introduce yourself in 20 oh, seconds? Okay. Yes, but we have to be quiet, okay? Uh, sí, I'm Carla Martinez de Salas. I'm the editor-in-chief of Vogue Mexico and Latin America. Um, I met Raul a few years ago um, when we started Project Paz. Yes. He was one of them. He is one of the members. Yay. And um, then I found out he was a photographer and we've been working together ever since. Thank you. Uh, when did you, do you remember what was your first like memory of fashion that you remember the first? Ever? Yes. I remember when I was a young girl and I was, I had just moved from El pa from Memphis to El Paso. Um, We, I um, was going, I started a new school and I made a new friend. Her name is Audrey Ponzio. And she uh, was wearing a sweatshirt and I went up to her and asked her what brand her sweatshirt was. Because I liked it so much. And my mom was like, Carla, you can't go up to people and ask them what brand they're wearing. It's, not very, it's, it's very rude. <laughs> yeah. So and ever since then, I kind of knew, wait, I need to turn off the group, the noise no problem. Um, except I can't turn this noise off yeah. but, um, um, so so I, I knew that I always had an interest in fashion since I was young my mom would buy Ola magazine still does and um, she would look through it and then she would take me to the grocery store with her and she was like oh, I can't take you anywhere every time I come to the grocery store with you um, I spend triple what I would spend because I have to buy all these magazines Okay. What did you go to school for? I studied marketing at the University of Arizona, which okay. I really kind of in hindsight wish I would have studied um, history or some sort of art, art history. I love world history. I wasn't very good at um, my finance or accounting classes. That's for sure. <laughs> uh, do you think education, formal education is important these days? Like you think it's very important to go to college these days? Listen, I think, you know, there's plenty of people like my sisters, my brother, my sister-in-law, whose father, um, I think, I don't think went to college and he's a very successful businessman. You know, I think it just depends on kind of what you want to do, obviously, for to be a doctor. Yes. To be a lawyer, to work in fashion. I think it's, I think school is a great place to make con contacts. I think it's, a, I think it's not only just what you learn, but more of, of who you meet and and kind of what you see in the world. I always think that that's important. Um, and, and there is a certain, um, you know, there's a nice feeling to be to being in college. I feel like if you start working right away, that it's kind of, the, you miss out on like four years of where you can just kind of go to school and have fun. A fantasy. Yeah. Um, what was it the first time that you got money for a job, even as a kid? you remember what was your first like job? The first time you got money for doing something? My first job, I think, was um, my dad used to um, let us work at his office during the summer just to kind of keep us busy. And um, we would have to like file during the office, during the summer. And it was really boring, but they paid us. And, and I remember my mom made me work one summer because I went to Europe for the first time. And I decided to like spend all this. I decided to buy my dad. I remember I bought my dad a tie at Chanel. And he's like, 
<laughs> Why using my money to buy me myself something that I would never buy myself? Uh, why did you move to New York? I moved to New York in um, August of 2000. Okay, and why? Because you wanted to live here? I wanted to live here. I, after graduation, I moved to Paris, and I really wanted to work there, but I didn't have a visa, and it was hard, not that easy to get a job in um, at, at in the editorial at the time if you didn't have a working visa in France. So my dad said, okay, that was nice. I, I let you go learn French for six months. Now get to work. So I moved to New York a few um, months later. I, I graduated in 1999 and I moved to Paris for almost a year. And then I moved to New York in August of 2000. Was your first job in, publish, in publishing or in fashion? Or like yes. In no, it was it. I was at a magazine called Mademoiselle that some of you um, might remember. Um, it was one of the first magazines that closed in 2000. It was one of the oldest magazines. By Condé Nast? It was kind of like a, like a, a version of Glamour, um, a Glamour before it went fully digital. It was um, kind of a mix between like um, good housekeeping, home, and like it was by Condé Nast? And Glamour. It was by Condé Nast or no? Yeah, it was Condé Nast. Yeah. Okay. And then I went to work at Elle for a year, and then I went to work um, at Vogue after that. Okay. Uh, somebody asked me here, how do you, because they read that you work at Vogue US. So that, how do you get into Vogue US? And okay, I know that so, story. I know um, that story because you have told me so many times. Yes. So um, I was working at Mademoiselle, and a friend of mine, um, named Gareen Zarunian. She's the, the, the VP of um, public relations at Armani now, was working at, um, I think Yves Saint Laurent at the time. And she said to me, oh, there's a job opening at Elle. Are you interested? And so I went to go work at, oh, sorry, that was not. So because I did all these internships during the summer, a friend of mine had introduced me to someone at Elle. And I interviewed at Elle and I got the job to be, um, Nina Garcia's assistant, or a woman named Sue Owen, and then I work, went to work for Nina. And while I was working for Nina, my friend Doreen said to me, Carla, there's a job opening at Vogue, and one of the girls left, and they can't seem to find a good assistant for Wendy Hirschberg. Would you be interested? So I was like, sure. So I went to interview, and they were like, you know, it's super tough. Um, you'll see, you know, it's really hard to get in the door, so be happy that you got an interview. And and my interviews actually went really well. I met with Grace Coddington, and then I met with Anna. Um, and, and, and a few weeks later, I got the call, and I got offered the job. And I was like, oh my god, wait. I, I, and, and when I got there, it was kind of a different time. I think I was like the only Mexican person working there, um, for sure. And then I worked there for four years. I, I remember I was, someone had just asked me because she was disappointed about not getting a job. I interviewed for the accessories director job and Anna didn't give it to me. And, and that was disappointing. But at the same time, um, it kind of pushed me to learn um, different things. After that, I went to work for Elisa Santizi, who was um, the style director at the time. And then Doreen, my same friend, called me to work because there was a job opening at T. I I see. So um, she said, you know, Stefano Tonki, who I didn't know at the time, I think that's, you know, working at, at Vogue, you kind of have this like very fashion vision and, and um, Stefano came from the men's world. So I wasn't sure who he was, but I was like, sure. And when I got there, um, I interviewed and apparently later I found out they had actually given the job to someone else, but she declined. Um, and so they gave the, I ended up, they ended up offering the job to me. I was their second choice, but you know, Second choice be, can be good. So yeah. um, I took the job and um, yeah, so I have Gareen to thank for that actually. Wow. Uh, what was, uh, what is the biggest challenges of your current job? Like that in Vogue, Mexico, if it's like a huge thing, what is, what is the most challenging part about that job? Because all the um, girls, things that it's so like easy and glamorous and you only get to wear ni nice things and go to shows. But they don't, they don't know the business. They don't know how right. to organize your offices whenever I visit it and so many papers that you have and numbers and stuff. So what is it? I what think is it? one of the biggest challenges, as you know, is the budget. We have very small budgets compared to any other um, Vogue. Let and me ask you that. Let me ask you that. Do you remember that being a challenge since forever, since you joined like years ago? Or no? it's, been, it's been obviously having worked in the U.S. and knowing what the budgets were at those magazines. 
Um, yeah, for sure. I mean, it's nothing so, compared to what I've, what the kind of budgets that I had been used to working with. So what, the minute I got there, yeah, they've always been a big challenge. It's just trying to figure out like how to allocate it. You know, do you spend more on the cover and maybe less on the front of book? Um, and then also it's two different magazines, which two people, which people really don't realize. Um, and so you have to create content. It's not fair for the person living in Argentina or Chile to kind of have to read about Mexico all the time and vice versa. So it's finding that balance. I think that's one of the biggest challenges of my job for sure. But, but since you remember when you were like way younger and you work at Vogue US, the budget was always a thing or there was a time when budgets were like fine? Oh, no, no, no. Budgets were... I mean, when I was an intern yeah, exactly. at Harvard Bazaar in Paris a few years, like in 1999, I remember us putting a package on the Concorde. Wow. On the Concorde. <laughs> I remember doing a shoot and, and uh, uh, one of the girls and I going back and forth on the Eurostar with couture dresses. And, <clears throat> and it was definitely something that... I can imagine. Was not, would never happen today. You know, you yeah. do like an easy studio shoot or something very basic, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And how, how do you like, uh, today I think it's about how we, can we do more with less and how we take advantage of those things and can we do video and can we do photos at the same time so we do the same production and all that. Uh, do you feel, because of your job, do you feel like you have a public responsibility? Like, do you feel like people look at you as if you're responsible for so many things and sometimes does that feel like heavy? I mean, I do feel like, you know, in, 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 I, I could have taken kind of the easy route and just done like a fashion magazine, another fashion magazine. And, you know. And not being a politician, like <laughs> you've been. And put like normal, you know, just like done good fashion shoots. And, but I think we wanted to take it to a different, place yeah. and I feel like there was a space for um, representing more of what Mexico and Latin America is and not doing you know um, not doing you know a shoot that was kind of you know if you think about it like the American magazines arrive in Mexico they arrive in Colombia they arrive yeah. in, in a lot of these countries now they're all online so you know for me to go after like a Reese Witherspoon when American Vogue is probably going to get her first and with you know a bigger budget then I was thinking well there's a bunch of young talented Mexican and Latin actresses that people are looking up to why don't we work with them and give them a voice and you yeah. know and, and that's kind of the the route we've decided to take Um, that's not to say that we're never going to put, and we did put, you know, someone like Gigi Hadid. Um, yeah, and Carly and stuff like that. And Carly and, and those people. I feel like, you know, that, that, I feel like it's important. The balance is good, but I do feel like it is important to think about um, different faces. And, and I feel like we've gotten, you know, to a point where a lot of people discover new talent through our magazine and brands come to us saying you know we love what you did with these three women we had never heard of them can we do a project that's similar yeah. with for our for our customers so um i think what we've done so far is 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 good and and great with with what with the resources that we're given right yeah of course yeah uh has your opinion on like inclusion and diversity sustainability all those things Have they changed after you took this role? Do you think yes. you think differently because um, you were maybe not that aware before I, or not aware? I, I think you know. I don't know. I I I have I've always been. You know, I grew up in El Paso, but I did live in Memphis. Um, I did live in Memphis, Tennessee, when I was growing up, and my sister and I were the only two Mexican girls in the school. So, the fact that I never felt kind of Mexican, but I've never felt American, and and there's this kind of not fitting in. Yeah. Um, and but I had kind of just trained my eye to say, oh, but it's okay, you know that that we didn't put like a uh, you know brown Mexican girl on the cover because we put someone from Argentina or whatever. But I definitely think it's important, girls. I definitely think it's it's a really important issue um, right now. I think it's, you know, we've gotten so used to, we had gotten so used to seeing 
um, the world through, um, I did an interview a while ago and I, uh, for PBS and a friend of mine said to me, you know, thank you for putting someone that looks like me on the cover. Yeah. And that was almost two years ago. And that was something that has kind of, that I've been mindful of um, because beauty is not, is not, it, there isn't one type of beauty. There's all types of beauty. That's why, you know, Yeah. that's why some people find love, some don't, you know? <laughs> um, <laughs> some people, you know, there's someone for everyone. And I do feel yeah. like beauty is the same, is the same way. And I think the definition of, uh, you know, kind of the Vogue cover girl has changed. Yeah. What is the main reason you go to Fashion Week? Um, let, let everybody think, know in a, in, a, in a way that they can understand. Yeah, I mean, we go basically to, to see what the collections of the designers, um, some clients and some non-clients that are showing and what their proposals are for the next um, season. You know, in, in hindsight, you know, when we're looking at, I, I feel like the fashion show has also evolved very much to being for buyers and, and, and press. It's now more inclusive. It's now for customers, for influencers, for press. You know, it, shows are very big. Now, you know, up to a few months ago, we were doing shows all over the world, flying to Morocco for two days, which is an amazing experience. Um, and, but you know, obviously these are all things that are going to change in light of, of, of the world that we're living in today. Um, but, but I think it's also important, you know, you meet, you meet people, you kind of hear what's going on in, in, in the fashion kind of zeitgeist and, and um, come back with story ideas, with um, collaborations. It, it kind of is like, you know, the three weeks of, or four weeks, um, if you, if you do them all, The month. Uh, um, meeting with, you know, the most creative people in, in, in some of the most creative people in the world and how that, you know, being around that can, can help you create, you know, your, your next issues. You obviously have that in mind. So is, so their, their business, is their business involved in you going? Yes. Yes, okay. for sure. I mean, you meet with clients, you meet with photographers, you meet with stylists. Francisco. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's fine. It's good. Um, if, if the magazine, if we think the magazine is 100%, how much do you think creatively and how much do you think like as a business? Um, you know, I wish I could say it was 80% creative, but obviously, you know, we, I split my time um, with both. I mean, it depends. Some issues are more, you know, more, um, I would say, things that we do like 360 projects with the brand or you know but but i think you're always i'm always kind of thinking about it even if it is creative i say okay but how can we make this something that our clients will like or or our um readers so i think do it's you, a little bit of both i see do you have a way to measure when a, you when an when an issue was like very successful how do you yes i mean measure? we get um reports on um like say, newsstand reports Um, but also just by, by um, our website, you know, we, we, about traffic on the site and what brings, um, what brings, what, I think Instagram is a good indicator also, and Facebook, you know, when we put the Yalita cover out, I remember I got like 9,000 likes in like, you know, two days on our, on our, um, on the Vogue Instagram, there were, I think, 100,000. Yeah. Um, you know, you made and, the news with that cover. Yeah, and then we and did one and... that we did one last year with um, the Bolivian Cholitas that yeah. did really well, and with um, a transgender woman um, from the Mushas community in Oaxaca. So it, there were there are definitely some that you can tell right away, um, but but the website is growing a lot. Um, we almost have I think five million users in the past. It's amazing now. It's so easy now to navigate. And, I love it. And so um, we had like kind of a, we, last year they redid, re, they redesigned the website to be like the other um, Vogue internet. If you follow other Vogues, they look the same, except that the language is different. So, yeah. and it's more user friendly. It's better to use on the, on the phone. Um, so yeah. um, that's exciting. So I think that's a big indicator as well. That's awesome. Um, when looking for new talent, what are you looking for? 
I think I like to see people that are doing their own thing that kind of aren't following um, what other people are, are doing or what other photographers are doing. I think, um, especially with, with photographers, you know, some a point of view, you know, um, something that they're passionate about, um, something that, that you can see, um, you know, if they love to travel, that you, that, that comes across in their pictures. Yeah. I think um, for designers, the same, you know, um, I think a lot of what happens, um, you know, in, I feel like there's so such interesting proposals, for example, like from someone like Barragan or Gypsy Sport, that I think is following us. They're doing their own thing. Yeah. You know, they're, they're following their own path. They're not doing ruffles because. You know, yeah. I feel like they're really, they have a voice. So I think that's super important. Um, that's super important to, to keep in mind. I think the same thing with stylists, um, someone that has a, their own unique vision that isn't following someone else's. Um, I, see. I think that's important. How do you do in a, difficult, in a difficult situation? How do you do it with a problem? Are you a calm person? Do you yell? Do you like, go out <laughs> for a while? Like, how do you do it? If you're in a problem in uh, your job, at my job, well, I refer back to the book that you gave me. What is it called? The the uh, uh, the symbol of, of not giving a fuck. The, yeah, um, it depends. <laughs> I mean, I think sometimes people can definitely take advantage, and um, yeah. they need to be called out um, for yeah. sure. I feel like that's one thing that that in 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 work I've I've try. I'm not a very confrontational person, but. Um, in 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 work situations, I do feel like you need to to tell someone when they've done something wrong, or you know, if you're not happy with something, you I you need to express it because if you because if you don't, then it kind of then you don't get you're not getting the work that you want. And yeah, and so I do feel like when um when we, like we don't have the for example i'll give you a good example like we don't have the the budget or we can't afford to reshoot things you know to like okay. have something killed so so when you know when i ask for kind of pictures before to see how it's going um i'd like to see them and um and 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 we do things as a team so um and and now you know the 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 guys that work at the magazine we kind of we have, uh, you know, we understand the sensibility that we're looking for. So I think that's important. And communication, obviously, is is key. What do you do when your creativity is not flowing? Do you have a trick? Mm. Like, I go but, out and I give a walk to the, my blog. That's what I do. Yeah, I mean, I think, like, going for, like, if you're angry or, you know, um, I think that you can, yeah, definitely breathing. I think is, is important and, and going out for a walk, as you said, like if you're on set, you're not getting the picture or, you know, it's not working and something's not, maybe just going out. Sometimes, you know, the other day we were on set for our April cover and, and we just needed some food and we brought in some, you know, Snacks. some tacos from Khalifa and, and after <laughs> that, everything went, you know, Junio. everything was fine. So, um, I think depth walks are important. Taking a deep breath. Um, I think it's important to, to, you know, think before. That's also one thing. Like, yes, if I'm mad in an email, maybe I'll send it to my husband or something because he, you know, will help me kind of calm down. And instead of me just sending, like, the first thing that I write, I, yeah. I write it, get it out, and then I kind of retract it so that someone else can see it and say, okay, um, you know, sit, th use this word versus this one. I learned know. that a lot. Yeah. Somebody, somebody, when I started, like when I was assisting a photographer and I was sending emails for like booking models for her, him or whatever, like years ago, like I, he would ask me to like read my own emails like three times. And after that, like send that if I was sure yeah. about it. And until this day I do it and I, find mistake and mistake and mistake like you know the more that i read it it's like geez. or maybe if you're like okay i don't want to be rude i want to be yeah. tough but not rude yeah then you kind of take it back but yeah you know but with you we, huh? you have your own language by email like you know i i learned to read your emails and understand <laughs> them because your emails are like carla's emails are like one line and like oh maybe like even just the subject and that's it 
So whenever, like years ago, when you give me the first job and I was just like, is she mad? Is she okay? Is she like, does she like me? Does she not? Like, and then with the years and the time, I kind of like learned to understand your own language and how you read and how you like type and whatever. And just, it's just the way you are. You're like on the spot. So yeah, that's my biggest achievement. Uh, who are your heroes? Who are my heroes? Your heroes, yeah. It could be professional or personal. I'm trying to think. I don't know. I, I feel like I always, um, my sister's saying, and by text, that no one understands me. <laughs> um, it's funny, though, because um, I, you know, you, now we're always in communication with the editor-in-chiefs of different Vogues. And, and so I, I'll, I write Anna an email, and she'll respond to me very politely. And, and a friend of mine recently said, you know, it's, you know, if it's, if she responds to you and you kind of don't understand what she's saying, that means Anna wrote it, not her assistant. Wow. So okay. I thought that was quite fun. I guess it's a thing of, you know, a busy brain. Yeah, of um, course, of course. Yeah. I, kn I never took it personal. I just want to, I just want to like, okay, maybe I need more information. Like what else do I do? And <laughs> you know, like for that also, that also kind of like led me to be a little bit more proactive and just kind of like do as much as I can and just put it to you and, and then you will just say like, yes or no, change this, change that. So, yeah. you know, in a, in a way, kind of like it pushed me to be a little bit more proactive and just put it easy for you. So you could be like, yes, no, yes, no, or whatever. Um, okay. Um, I'm trying to think who my heroes are. I mean, I guess, um, mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I think they change all the time. But when yeah. I was a little girl, I would say my grandmother. Okay. I would say that, that someone that, that, uh, you know, she died when I was five, but okay. the fact that someone that you can remember someone so visually and remember her smell and, and what she did as a person and in her life. Yeah. Um, when you're five, I think that that must be someone that really has, has had a lot of impact on you. Um, I would say um, my father who also passed away that, that when I was 25. Um, she was a doctor, right? Yeah. And, okay. Um, I I read all these things in the news right now about all these doctors and the doctors that went to that flew to Italy from Cuba and I'm sure. And I think my dad would have been like 73, so he probably wouldn't have been in the best. Um, but but no, Italy, my dad is 73. Yeah, I mean, or he must have been, then he must be older than your. He, he would have been older than yours, but but okay. um, you know, he was someone that would you know cross the bridge to Juarez and take, um, go operate there for no money and, and because he loved doing it. And, and that's someone that has kind of taught me, that really taught me to have conviction and, and love what you do and, and, and help people and always, um, you know, do things for others just because you don't know what kind of situation yeah. you find yourself in. Yeah. Um, I would say also, I, I have an aunt that lives in Memphis um, that that when I think about it, you know, she married a black man in the early 80s. And she was like, I don't care what anyone says. And he, you know, and, and you know, married someone for love and uh, in Memphis in 1985. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. there was Street really Street. no Mexicans there. Yeah. And, um, and not a lot of um, biracial couples. So yeah. um, I think they change all the time. But I would say that those are kind of the the ones that I remember the most and my mom, because right now that I'm home with my two kids and you understand, four, I'm like, holy shit. Yeah. <laughs> How yeah. did you do it? You know? Yeah. Um, it's crazy. I mean, it's, it's really like going to work is so much easier than staying home. Let me tell you. Yeah. Um, and this is week so, one. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, I mean, your mom's probably from the same generation as mine. They were raised in, in a different way to not complain. And, you know, she lived in Memphis and Orlando and had no one help her except for when my yeah. family would go stay with her for a month. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. I remember, I remember my, my, both of my parents have worked since forever. So my mom, you know, my, my grandmother used to take care of us when we were kids, uh, but that grandmother didn't like us very much, me and my sisters. Uh, so we will always complain with my mom, like, and the night, like, mom, I don't want to go with my grandma anymore. And my mom was like, I need to work. Like, there's no other way around for this. And, you know, so for like years, we put up with that. 
uh, but because I knew that my mom was working and because she, she always explained us since we were very little, like, this is so you have a better life. This is so we have a better car. This is so you can go to school. So we, now that I, when I listen about shit about like, oh no, because I don't want to work because I need to be with my kid 24 seven. I'm like, my mom wasn't 24 seven with me and I think I'm okay. Like, you know <laughs> I mean? So I have major respects for people like my mom, like yours, like you personally, that you have a full-time job, two kids, a husband, a social life, you know, and, and, and you wonder like, how do they do that? And now I can, I don't know what I'm going to have for breakfast tomorrow, to be honest. And you know, my mom hired <laughs> The social for life is going by the wayside, but yeah. But no, I mean, definitely like, and especially, um, you know, now that in the situation that we're living, there's certainly people that can't stay home. You know, there's yeah. nurses, doctors, yeah. all those people that kind of, people at the supermarket delivery, people like all those, kind of unsung heroes that that are out and and can and don't have the option you know i think that's something that 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 we don't even think about is like we we take it so for granted of having like deliveries at our house you know we yeah. don't even know the conditions that that they're under but yeah how do you keep your mental health do you have any hobbies outside like fashion something super random that you love to do that like helps you to like get grounded me, I, I mean, I love to exercise. I try and um, last week was kind of the first week of the working from home and I was waking up at eight and working out at like night and or in the middle of the day. And I'm like, wait a minute. No, I have to go to work. I have to pretend I'm going my my the upstairs part of my house is my office. So I need to get up at the time that I would run, do some yoga, whatever. I mean, that's like something that's really like a key part of my day. It kind of helps really keep me sane. Okay, perfect. And people here is asking, when did you discover what, you ta what your talents were? Were people pointing them or you knew that you had them? No, I, I, I don't, you know, I wasn't sure. Um, I, I wasn't sure. I knew I knew I wanted to work in fashion, but um, I wasn't sure exactly what I wanted to do. I thought that that meant like writing books or um, writing, you know, uh, being a buyer or, you know, being a fashion designer. And then I did an internship in, in New York and I realized that I didn't want to do sales, for example. Mm -hmm. But then an editor came in and was doing um, a poll for a celebrity for W and I was like, oh my God, what is she doing? And I got interested in that. That's why I'm saying like, I was in college when I discovered that. So sometimes maybe it might not, what you study might not get you there, but it will help you to either do an internship that you where you discover what you want to do or meet someone that kind of works in something or can guide you in the right direction. Whenever a young photographer asks me if what school does she or he needs to go, I always tell them to not go to school for photography. I always tell them, go and do something else and do photography, but like do marketing, do business, do fashion education or like art or like somebody that helps you to kind of like, because I feel like the arts is a talent that either you have it or you don't. I, I do believe that you right. can educate yourself, but I feel like it's, if you have it, it's going to happen if you practice. I right. know very. I know so many photographers that are that I went to school for photography, and they think in a very artistic way. And I always look at them, and I'm like, "How oh, God, I wish I could think like them." But and then you see this other side, and they, and they don't know exactly how to make a conversation. They don't know how to approach a person. They don't know how to write an email uh, for a business. They don't. Right, this. and so, all those things are very important. Yeah, I mean, you can be the most artistic guy, but if nobody's gonna buy your art, I mean, where does it lead you? So whenever somebody asks me, I'm like, don't go to school for photography. Do it, and then do it something else. Yes, yeah, exactly. exactly. Um, yeah. Well, what is the best? We have another question. Yeah. Okay. What is the best advice? Uh, to a college student that to that want to work at Vogue, um, I think the best advice is, uh, I mean, what I did is 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 do internships, get some practice, meet people, talk to people. I mean, now in this day and age, there's no, you know, you I I used to have to pick up the phone to get an internship. I mean, people can send you a direct mail. Um, there's LinkedIn. There's so many. Um, there's so many places to to get um, experience. I feel like experience is super important while you're in school. Uh, the best advice for an emerging brand in Mexico? Um, I think that emerging brands anywhere, not just in Mexico, should yeah. have like a proper business plan made. Um, I think that they need to, um, you know, before they go out and show a collection, they need to be able to 
to know if they're going to be able to produce that collection. Okay. Um, see how, you know, I think define your brand, know what your brand is, um, do a business model kind of research other brands and what they're doing um, as far as, you know, growth and, and selling. And if you're going to be direct to consumer, then you be direct to consumer. If you want to sell internationally, um, definitely see what you need to do to sell internationally. I think a lot of people kind of just create these brands and then they realize two years later that, Eek, guess what? It was a lot of work and they don't want to do it. Um, so I feel like also like define, is it going to be a hobby? Or is yeah. this what you my want job. to do? My job. Um, so I think that's really important. But most importantly, just have a, a very good business plan made. Um, project how much money you'll need, how much money you'll need to produce if someone buys from you. If you need to travel and show your collection, um, do good line sheets. Some people don't even have line sheets made when they show their collection. Have it photographed. You know, have like a lookbook to present. Um, don't spend a million dollars on the wrong things, you know, on like spending, doing a, like a fancy show. invite out for your show when you can't even pay for the production, you know? So I feel like there's, there's a lot of um, steps that, that, that um, people should take. What's the photo shoot that you remember the most? At Mex in Mexico or? I mean, in, uh, Korea, anyway, the one that you remember the most. It could be when you were an intern or when you were a... <laughs> Um, in Mexico, I know which, which one you're going to say, but. Um, and when I was, um, when I was an intern at W. Okay. Um, in 1997 or 98, <laughs> I can't remember, 1998. Yes, um, I good. remember, and I always tell, I tell her this, Alex White was doing a shoot in Argentina, uh -huh. um, with Mario Testino at the, uh -huh. um, What's that famous hotel? The Patagonia? Not the Park ah. Hyatt. The, um, ¿Cómo se llama el hotel super famoso en Buenos Aires? Um, Alvear Palace. Oh, okay. It's like sí. one of the most famous hotel, um, hotels there. And um, I remember we had to like count all, like do the car day for her shoot. And we packed like 50 trunks to for go to the shoot. <laughs> and... The, I was so excited to see the result, but just like, I mean, there's like endless shoots that I, one of the ones that I actually just saw um, Michael Ariano from Mark Jacobs posted uh, when I was an assistant at Vogue, Tawny and Grace did a shoot together um, after John Galliano did a collection inspired by India yeah. and um, we shot all these different models and they painted their faces. There's like a, a ceremony in India. Yeah. And they were all painting was based on where they all paint each yeah. other and Steven Mizell was and taking Steven pictures Mizell. and uh, they asked me to go to set to help. So I went and I was so excited and Steven Mizell's assistant, Steven Mizell likes to listen to the same song the whole day. So oh yeah, played, I know that. I know that. So we heard um, one of the songs from Monsoon Wedding. It, that was the song that he was playing? Maybe 500 he said times. In, he said in an interview, you know why he does that? Oh, no. No. He said in an interview, there's, there's two or three interviews out uh, there of him, and I know every single one by word by word. And he said that because uh, when he has more than one model, or like three models, he wants uh, like a face or an expression from every model at certain time. So if he play the song like over and over and over, like the models will know exactly at what time of the song they need to do what. Okay. So, so Sara yeah. just said that the, the, the ceremony is called Holy. Holy, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and um, they all so, paint them like it's colorful and they have powder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we had um, like Carolina Trentini and um, one of the uh, model that just walked down the, the runway at Balmain too, like the Brazilian models. But it was, and, and, and something interesting that Michael said was, would we be able to do this shoot now? Or would it be, would you get like bashed for cult culture? Oh, yeah. Um, but it was really like one of the most intense, most Did fun shoots that we ever, I think I, I have the a Polaroid of Leslie Fremar um, and I, who was Tani's assistant at the time. We have a picture together, like covered in this blue paint. 
and Pat did the makeup and Guido did the yeah, makeup. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The typical my sales team, like, you know, for when I was an assistant, when I was assisting photographers, that was my, that was my dream to go on set with Steven, but I never get to do it. Like, I know one or two guys that are like assistant of the assistant of the assistant, but I never got like to, to know that. And three years ago or four years ago, I saw him in the street uh, on the Upper East Side. <laughs> and I was like froze. I was like froze to death. And I was like, should I say something? Should I not? And I just remember all these interviews about him and like what people say about him. And I was like, I'm not going to say anything. I just like took a picture of him from afar and just saved it in my phone. And, and like once every other month, I look at a photo. I'm like, oh my God, I, I, once I met Steven myself in the street, blah, blah, blah. But it's, it was one of those dreams that you were like, who knows? Maybe one day at like as a client or whatever. Yeah. So, but but it's, there's, he has so many stories. He's my favorite photographer ever. And he has so many stories and so many things that people think about it. You know, when I ask Lynn Acey and Luisana, like, how is to shoot with them? And they will like tell me like, oh, he's the nicest person in the world. But and then I will ask an assistant and they're like, well, you cannot look, look at him in the eyes. And I'll be like, so is he nice or is he not? Like, so is this, is this, you know, gray line that I don't know who is lying, who is telling the truth or whatever. But, uh, okay, one more. Tell me when you don't have time or when, when Pacoro needs, uh, needs to eat. Uh, how do you incorporate European trends to Mexican readers? How do you globalize Vogue Mexico? Well, I think that it's pretty global as we, um, I, I think it's pretty global now, you know, just through the fact that now you don't have to wait to, you know, people in France, people in Japan, um, readers can access the magazine. Um, yeah. I think that that um, we, it's not really about the European or American or such and such trend. I think we, we're looking at the ideas that come out of the runway. Yeah. Um, sometimes those ideas are inspired by Latin America and by yeah. Latin designers. So I, I don't, I wouldn't call them like European per se, but um, I think we're talking um, to, yes, a Mexican and Latin American audience, but also a very international audience. Um, I think that most of the people here, um, I think most of the people in, in Mexico and Latin America are traveling all over the world. They're, they're very in tune with what's going on all over the world. Um, so we kind of do a balance of, of you know, um, designers from our own region, but at the same time, they want designers from other regions too. And um, I think that's the beauty of, of being global now. Yeah. Oh look! I, that's my that's my that's my only piece of art that I own. Steven Mysel, nineteen ninety three. I put all my ah. savings in that picture. See? Italian Vogue. Italian Vogue. So if this if this house is on fire one day, I'm just gonna grab that picture and run away. <laughs> uh, what do you think small brands should do once the health emergency is over to recover? Do you think it would change the way? Do you think it would change the way that people look at fashion, like this thing that is happening right now? I mean, yeah, for sure. I mean, I think we're living something that, correct me if I'm wrong, is, is there is no kind of model to, to yeah. what has happened. Um, there's nothing of, you know, it's kind of like 9-11 in a way yeah. that, that, that changed, you know, people's, um, our generation's lives forever. Um, I think that that small brands definitely need to be active on on social media, and um, I think a, 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 some people, you know, there there are people out there that yes, you know, there's obviously tragic news coming out, but some people are, you know, manifest the, their anxieties by shopping and 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 yeah. by buying yeah. things. You know, yeah. the, the, you can't blame them for it. Everyone kind of grieves in their own way yeah um so i do think that small brands should should still be active and 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 everyone um through their own social media they should um speak to their customers um how they see fit obviously being sensitive to what's going on but um you know especially like maybe donating um working with a charity or yeah. you know i think it's all in the matter of the tone but they shouldn't just disappear i think that yeah. um, it's our responsibility to, to support them. Um, I think, um, you know, every industry will be affected in, in this. And I think it's just, you know, obviously we have hope in that um, hopefully you, there's, oh, there's always hope. 
um, um, to, you know, the way that things should should recover. Um, I think digital marketing is really important. Yeah. I think that, that now, I mean, imagine if this would have happened 20 years ago. What would you have done? You know, maybe you could, you had your website. Now you, you have access to everything um, every single day to your consumer. Yeah. So take advantage of that. And, and, yeah. and like I said, you know, people are working from home um, and you, you know, you're doing your, maybe you're, of course you're working from home, but you are a little distracted on, on your yeah. computer, you know, so take advantage of, of that captive audience and, and, Brands. And, and what brands can do, you know, and, and, and how to tell your story. I think you should continue to tell your story. Brandon um, Maxwell was very concerned on what to share. And he was asking the people, like, he was like, well, you know, I feel like the world is, like, collapsing right now. What should I share? I feel bad sharing, like, good fashion images, blah, blah. And then he come to an agreement to, like, keep it going. You know, he's like, we have the news. And, and that's the way the New York Times is, is, is giving us like the news every day. So I'm just going to give you some fun and some yeah, things to kind of exactly. like forget because, about. Exactly. You know, you don't want to, you know, when, when, when last week um, we had a, 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 something on Vogue Mexico and we were talking about how do we, you know, what are we looking for? And, you know, we're not scientists. So we're not yeah. going to, you know, regurgitate something that the New York Times is, is telling you. But um, what we found is that people want to talk about, you know, what are the best yoga studios? What are the be what are the best facial masks that you want to use? Um, you know, what do you what do you want to see? So so I feel like it's a little bit of, of um, I think it's the same with brands, you know, maybe yeah. I think it's important to to be conscious and aware and maybe work with um, a charity or a foundation that means a lot to you. I know a lot of designers have been doing it, but also that people want to be, see, be inspired and what's, what's going on in, in their head. Maybe right now they can't actually be do, working on production because their production is, um, is, you know, stalled. But, you know, I would love to see what, um, you know, Victor Barragan is thinking what Sandra Weil is thinking, like Joanna Ortiz has been sharing, you know, pictures of, of her lookbooks and her family. And, and I just, you know, I'm happy to see those. You want to see things yeah. that, that inspire you and, and that, um, and, and you make you dream, you know, like okay. today I posted a picture of, um, of a, a sea urchin from Sara. And I've been kind of going through my, I have like 26,000 pictures, right? In my phone. And Brenda That's an Diaz amazing idea what you're doing. 000. Brenda That's Diaz amazing. had 90,000. So I'm like, there's all these pictures that I took of all these market appointments, of all these amazing things that I got to see. Yeah. Why am I not going to share them? You know, I, yeah. I'm sure. And, and people want to see them. I thought, that, and you're I thought. helping someone else. And you're helping yeah, someone else. Yeah, exactly. We're, 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 keep, we're helping by keeping the conversation going, you know? And, yeah. And, and, and if we didn't do that, then I feel like, you know, all of us, as I said, you know, everyone, the thing that we all have in common is hope, right? You know, the yeah. only thing we know is that, um, you know, we will come out of this and, and you know, everyone, it, it, it too shall pass, you know? And, yeah, and, of course. And we need to be ready and, and kind of not like we've been asleep for a month, you know, yeah. but active and kind of rejuvenated in a way. Okay, I have two questions and that's it. So you can make dinner for your children. How is okay. PR industry in Mexico for fashion? I think the PR industry in Mexico has grown quite a bit. I think there's companies like Another, um, Lenom, that are doing really interesting things um, for their clients, um, you know, um, and other people. Like these are all companies that are creating like really cool events. Where yeah. <laughs> hopefully they'll come again in September. Yeah. Um, but um, I do feel like, um, you know, the, the, they're doing, it's, it's so much more than just, you know, sending book books out anymore. You know, it's like really engaging with the magazines, with influencers, telling stories, um, telling stories through um, events, through online, um, you know, in the same way that, and, and it's interesting now because, just because, you know, you can't do it a physical in-store appearance, you know, I'm working on something with Bloomingdale's and um, I'm the global curator, which is crazy, you know, that we're at the global bazaar at the carousel, which is an amazing opportunity. And of course, 
it like so happens to start in March, which is, who could have thought it was going to be such a bad month. But, you know, we want to do things digitally and get people going. So I think it's a way to, especially like public relations these days, like it means so much. So now, you know, you'll see it, like how, what kind of PR you can do, you know, when you, yeah. when you physically can't see someone, when you're pitching an idea and, and pitching an idea for websites, it's different than what you pitch to vote, to, to, you know, vote print. So I think it's, um, I think it's a good opportunity to, to um, know what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Right. So yeah, um, I feel like it's really like that opportunity right now. I was thinking this morning that I feel like after this thing, every designer and every brand, I feel like it, they're going to be allowed to do almost anything to gain people back or to bring back their attention. Like they're going to get really creative and they're gonna, I feel that everything, there's not going to be such a wrong thing. I feel like everybody's going to try to kind of like switch it and recharge and hopefully those who needed more attention gets it and you know. Right. And, but I do think, it, yeah, as I said, like don't take this time to like, relax just take it as a time to like really think of like the steps yeah. um, someone's asking me what to do with their lookbook like if you need to shoot it in the next couple of weeks you know shoot it on yourself do yeah and your phone interesting, um you know like do do some interesting things um you know do some interesting still lives or use yourself as a model i think it's kind of all um it's like a, the, the Wild West, you know, there are kind of are no rules. Yeah. Okay. And what, what, you know, for everybody who doesn't know, Carla has a tons of energy. And I always wanted to ask her, how does she do it? Like, I just, <laughs> how, how do you do it so much in one day? What is your secret? Well, usually. Um, in, an, in, in another days, reality. Even though I find myself on Zoom calls all day, like trying to do some homeschooling, <laughs> I'm terrible <laughs> at. Um, but I, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of boring. I mean, I, I go to sleep quite early. Um, I have a rule of, you know, I try and read um, a book, uh, like a, yeah, at least five pages a night of a book. Um, you know, I've been taking zinc. I have some vitamins. I love exercising. I feel like when I exercise, I have even more energy. Yeah. Um, I don't know. My dad used to say that you, you could sleep, you, you were to sleep all you want when you die and kind of like live to the fullest. So I always try and, and think about that. And like, you know, especially like if I have like a friend during, um, if, if I have like a friend that has an event and I'm tired, I'll always go for a friend. You know, I'm kind of one of those people that, um, I'm one of those people that, that loves to, to support um, the people that, that I believe in and, and my friends. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah, so, you are. Um, that's important. So I, I, I just figure it out and make it happen. Okay. Perfect, my friend. Thank you so much for this. This was awesome. Thank you for your this time. This was awesome. Thank you so much. I wanted to say hi. And uh, I hope you're good and your kids are good. And I wish I could be in your house in Oaxaca in these days. But I'm here. Oh, man. Well, if you can drive, you can go. <laughs> no, next year. Thank you for this. Take care ciao. of yourself. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Ciao, ciao.